And then he said, he said uh, these things as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. So they ask him, is the kingdom now? No, the full consummation is not yet, but the kingdom is inaugurated in this way. Go to Jerusalem. You're going to take my word to the ends of the earth and I'm going to bring my people unto me, preparing them for the return. Because what does the angel say? Right after this, they watch as he goes up, right? And the angel says, what are you looking? Wh where are you looking? Men of Galilee, why are you, why do you stand looking in the heaven? This Jesus who was taken up into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. So there's, there's the, there's the beginning question. Are you going to restore the kingdom now? Christ says, it's not for you to know, but what you can't, what I will tell you is the kingdom is established in this way. And as he goes up to heaven, he's saying, that's how things will be until I return. That's how it'll be. So church, how, what can we expect right now for the kingdom of God to look like? And what are we to do? Well, we are to live in light of Christ's promise that the full consummation will come. And we are to bring his word to the ends of the earth. That has been given to us as Gentiles, as we'll, as we'll see uh, as we go through Acts. And, um, and then now we're bringing the gospel to our families and we're evangelizing uh, to, the, to the world around us in, in certain particular ways. And we also begin, this is also important too, Acts begins with a king. Acts begins with the disciples in front of a king. How does Acts end? Acts ends with a disciple, an apostle in front of whom? A king. <laughs> and that's on purpose. And it ends there. It ends with Paul's ministry in front of a king. Because, again, it's, it's saying, in this world, this is how the kingdom of God is going to go forth. There's no other way. We're not building towards anything uh, like 99.9%. .9 this consummation, we're, we're not making things right for Christ's return. We're not tidying up the house so that when the when he comes back, everything looks great. We're actually going through the power of the Spirit and saving those whom he purchased on the cross. As they are being, and they will be sanctified for this kingdom that Christ will bring. He's bringing it. And we read that in Revelation 22 as he brings. And, and we even see that in, uh, in Thessalonians when... The, the dead are with Christ as he comes as a conquered king. The trumpets will blow and, and the kingdom is ushered in. All right, so, so we have the whole purpose of Acts right in chapter one. Right in chapter one. So what is this? What is this ultimately? It's a spiritual kingdom that we're going to be, that's going to be established now. So it begins with uh, the replacement of Judas. Uh, I know some people think that um, the choosing of Matthias was part of God's plan in that they are actually following God's, um, I guess, decree. They're going to attach the casting of lots to Proverbs that God is in, even in the casting of lots. That's, this was something they ought to do. I actually think that they were ahead of themselves. Um, it is true that you needed 12, right. To uh, really establish the kingdom. You have 12 judges that are going to be judging the 12 tribes of Israel, but who chooses the 12th? God chooses. What, what is a requirement of, what is a requirement of an apostle? Well, that's what they're going to say. They seize Jesus, right? They're going to say, well, it's got to be someone that sees him resurrected. Is that is that how an apostle is chosen? I thought the one who, who is the master chooses the disciple. All of the 12 were chosen by Christ. He went to them. It's got to be the same way. It can't be someone who just saw him rise from the dead. It actually has to be, Christ has to actually uh, commission him. And of course, who do you know is commissioned later? Paul's commissioned. Um, so we so we see like this, uh, we, and the disciples were like this in Christ's ministry, right? They they got ahead of themselves sometimes. Uh, you had the sons of thunder wanting to call fire down on cities, and and you know, Christ is like, whoa, whoa, you know, slow down. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I think you, you see guys getting ahead of themselves because they're 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 waiting for this power. They've been promised uh, the the kingdom coming in this way, and. They know that it's got to be, you got to have 12 disciples for the kingdom to be established. You have to. So they're going to, again, try to, I think this is, again, what I think. They're going to try to do it themselves initially. Uh, and God's going to say, no, I have my 12th that's coming. So they go to Jerusalem. We all know the coming of the Holy Spirit uh, comes on men. 
and empowers them. Uh, we, we know that everyone who's speaking different languages can understand each other. Um, and this is, this is to show that what Christ has promised, uh, he has authority to give. Right? This is another vindication of what Christ has done. This is proving that what, what, who Christ is and what he promises through his work is actually going to happen. So now you have, you have the Holy Spirit being poured out on men. You do see the symbolism of tongues, which is uh, in, in Scripture is a judgment. When there's confusing words, when people can't understand each other, that's a judgment to the people. When that's reversed, that's a blessing. So you see the power of God uh, in, in the work of his people uh, right now, because these are all Jews from different areas. One of the promises was that Israel would be reunited, right? Remember, Judea and Israel were separated when Solomon, after Solomon's reign. Um, and one of the promises was to bring Israel back together. Well, this is that this is that promise being fulfilled. John is very adamant about showing the Samaritans and the and the uh, and the Jews becoming one people again. Um, this is this is part of the promise of God's kingdom going out. And as Christ being king of a of a particular kingdom, his power is greater than any of any authorities that can try to squash that. So we have the coming of the Holy Spirit in chapter two. Uh, then we have Peter's sermon, right? Uh, Peter's sermon comes after the, the empowering of the Holy Spirit. The title says sermon. It's actually not a sermon. <laughs> uh, the word sermon, you might be surprised, is actually not in the Bible at all. Um, I, I just would say this is Peter preaching. When you see the word preaching in Scripture, it's typically to unbelievers. You preach to unbelievers and you exhort believers. So a lot of times when I say in church service, hey, let us now hear the preaching of God's word. I should probably be saying, let's let's now be exhorted. Preaching is typically for, you go to the synagogue and you preach. Who's at the synagogue? Are believers at the synagogue? No. <laughs> Jews are at the synagogue. Unbelievers. When they convert, where do they go? They go to the assembly, and then what do they hear? Exhortation. So this is Paul's preaching. This is Paul's empowerment to, to uh, th this, is the, this is the power that the kingdom gives God's people in speaking clearly, um, what they've done, our sin, their sin in this, uh, in this particular event is the crucifixion of Christ, and they're cut to the heart. So we have, we have Paul's preaching to the unbelievers. Uh, through that power, through the, the spirit or through the power of the spirit, they're convicted and they repent. This, this is literally, um, man, this is, can you imagine you go in ignorantly and, and kill the son of God ignorantly, and then that son of God rises from the dead? Are you going to be terrified? That's a terrifying thing. Now, let's say we're all guilty of that. We're all in this house together, and the guy we killed walks in. We're probably, we're probably going to be like, we're done. We're dead. He's here. We killed him. There, that can only mean judgment. But no, he comes in and, and offers parlay. You killed me, but you didn't know what you were doing. And now I'm offering you salvation. Uh, that sin I, I died for, repent and come to me, and, and I, I will not kill you. In fact, I will pardon your sin. You can be reconciled to the Father, and I will give you everything I died for. That's an amazing thing. That's the power of, of the kingdom that God has established now. Is there anything more powerful than that? Is there anything more powerful that we can build ourselves that can emulate that? No. Absolutely, absolutely not. And I, and that is that is the point that Luke is trying to get across. The other point that Luke is trying to get across is that as Christians, we're not going we're not going in, into Rome and try to ruffle feathers. Peter's Peter's talking to the Jews, right? He's talking to his own people. He's saying, look, this is what the people did. They crucified Christ. Now, the Gentiles are going to come in uh, soon after that as, as also guilty of crucifying Christ as much as the Jews are. However, it's saying, like, look, we're, we're going after our own people. We're not interested in, in coming, and uh, now our king has risen, and we're going to try to take over everything around us. That's not our purpose. Our purpose is a spiritual thing. The, the, the enemy is sin. It's not Caesar right now. And, and if you're a ruler, wouldn't that be appealing to you if you had a citizens that would actually say, our God says 
to honor you. And we rebuke those who go against that. That should for for a, for a governmental authority that should be like yeah, uh, you know what? I'm going to support you, because I want I want peace in the land. You know that's what, what rulers should want. I want peace in the land. Of course, we see uh, that takes quite a drastic turn later, but we'll get to there. Um, so we see we we see the we see uh, the Jews saved right through uh, Peter's preaching, and then we see the fellowship of believers. Now you can imagine if you're a government official reading this. Um, you might see a bunch of free look because right who who um, primarily who are being saved at this point? A lot of them are poor, are poor Jews, like uh, not well off. Now you can imagine if you get a if you get a horde of poor people, <laughs> like you think that they're going to be a menace. Like think of think of San Francisco where you got like uh, you got the poor the, the communities out there that just wreck the place, right? That's uh, can you? I think that's what the government has in mind when you when you see these poor Jews coming and being converted to the sect. Um, but but Luke's going to say in Acts, like, no, 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 this is the power of God. We don't need you for sustenance. God is actually going to give us the means through wealthy individuals, because remember, God saves the wealthy and the poor. He's going to save individuals that will allow us to live together and actually to take care of one another. We're not going to be a burden on you. Because guess what? Our kingdom is more powerful than all the, the economy you've established, the, the kingdom you've established. Our sustenance is attached to Christ and his promise and the spirit that he's given us. And we're going to look after one another. I think that's a that's a, a powerful testimony for the gospel. Uh, I don't know. if Are we minded that way? Uh, I think I think particularly this church, we are we push that. Right. I, I think we are. We are minded that way that, look, we need to take care of one another. We shouldn't rely on on the systems given to us uh, by certain governments to sustain us. The first thing is, are we are are we sustaining each other? Right. We have a in chapter three, a lame beggar healed again. This is uh, I, I believe there's a lot of reasons this is in Acts. But again, Luke is emphasizing the power of the kingdom of what's been given to to the disciples. This isn't just uh, hearsay. This isn't just disciples that stole Jesus out of the grave. This is power. They're healing people. Now, again, as a ruler, and you see uh, a religious sect claiming all these all these authoritative things, and now they're actually healing your citizens. That sounds pretty good. <laughs> right? What's the... You think about like the what's what's the biggest tax on a society, even our society? It's usually like Medicare, right? It's uh, people's health. They they get older, they live longer, and they they're a toll on the system. And you know we got to take care. Ultimately, what's being said is like, look, um, the power of this kingdom is in um, even healing uh, the physical deformities as a picture again of what the ultimate kingdom will look like when there will be no infirmities. But it is also to show like Christ's words actually matter. His power is in this. You guys don't have that. You guys can't heal your people like that. You have you have medical systems that fail most of the time. People still die. You might you might get them to limp along a little bit longer, but at the end of the day, that that infirmity is going to take them. Uh, this is a picture that like we have authority greater than that. If God wants us to, we can heal all these people. That's the power that of the kingdom that's been given us. We have another um, sir, we have another uh, preaching and uh, Solomon's portico by Peter. Um, we have chapter four where Peter and John are, are br brought before the council. Um, again, I think this uh, in a lot of ways, Luke is showing that the, f the followers of Christ are, are are good citizens adhering to the rules of law, right? Um, they're going, if they're, if they're sequestered, if they're like, Hey, we're going to question you. They're like, yeah, sure. Right. And then they go to the judgment and the I, I, Luke lays out what, what they're guilty of, which is preaching in the name of Christ. Uh, if you're, if you're an authority reading this, you're like, that's where they're accused of what they're accused of just preaching that this Christ is risen again. It's to say like, we're not a problem. Actually, the, the Sanhedrin here are the problem. This committee here is the problem. We're actually the ones uh, preaching a message of rest, uh, restoration, restitution, of reconciliation. 
And and look at the look at the accusations they bring against us. It's not true. We're not we're not going around stealing people's money, right? Um, and giving them false hope. No, no, no. We're, we're preaching Christ crucified and Christ resurrected. And if the best thing they have is that we preach in His name, you have nothing to worry about. Uh, we go to uh, later in the chapter four, they had everything in common. Again, it's showing that um, God's people take care of themselves. Uh, we also have Ananias and Sapphira. Um, this is uh, <laughs> this is showing, I, I believe this is showing that in the church, we uh, there's church discipline. Um, uh, we're not letting people get away. Uh, God is not letting people get away with crime uh, in, inside the body even. Uh, th this is a kingdom ruled by... Um, uh, a law written on people's hearts. Uh, we're conformed in the image of Christ. And when we sin and there's not repentant sin, God is harsh on that unrepentant sin. And in this case, we see Ananias and Sapphira, of course, lying to the Holy Spirit and them uh, saying that they sold the land for a particular amount. And, uh, and they lied about the amount that they sold it for. So the, what happened was like they had a piece of land and the actual uh, price they sold it for was like let's say ten thousand, but they told they told everyone that oh we only sold it for five. So it wasn't that they didn't give everything that they uh, earned from selling the land. It was like why would you say you only sold it for five and then keep five? Like when you sold it, wasn't all the money yours? Like you could have done what you wanted with it. It's it's to show like look no like we take sin seriously. We're not a bunch of uh, you know a band of criminals just doing what we want. We're in a kingdom that's orderly. We're in a kingdom that uh, is to love one another and to speak truth to another Christian and not, not, get, not ill gain, not take from one another and not lie about uh, and make us look better or whatever the reasons uh, and I since fire did what they did. Um, but to show that there's real discipline there. Again, we have uh, more signs and wonders. The apostles are arrested and freed. Again, <laughs> this is important too. When the apostles are arrested, are they the one? Do they break themselves out of prison? When, when, how are they released every time? <laughs> huh? Yeah, it's, it's literally God releasing them, right? And not only that, but you, are there always witnesses to that? Like, are they are they just saying no? They're just promise me we we escaped through an angel. Well, everyone, like, there's an earthquake. Guards are going to kill themselves because the prisoners are gone. And Paul's like, oh, no, 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 stop. We're still here. Like, again, it's just showing we're not a, we're not trying to escape this because because if this if everything that that Christ says is true, then he's going to he's going to sustain our lives even in prison. He's going to let us free. We don't need to to break out on our own. God's going to do what He does. And do you want to fight against that God? Do you want to fight against the one that is actually letting us out? Do you want to fight against the one that's actually healing our people? Do you want to fight against the one that actually puts to death those that lie to the Holy Spirit? We have the, uh, in chapter six, we have the deacons chosen. Again, it's showing that, that the, the people of God take care of one another when there is a lack, when there is a lack the people of God come together and fix it. Apostles say it is not good for us that we serve tables. We need to pray and we need to teach. Uh, the deacons are raised up. We got we have the I think seven of them, right? I just I think I just said that. Yeah, seven are chosen to serve. Um, and and there's no partiality. The point is there's no partiality in this group. This isn't a gang that chooses particular people and then shoves everybody else away. No, no, this is the God saves who he wills. And none of those people that are saved, none of those people that claim Christ will go hungry, will be lacking. And we're going to make sure of that we're going to we're going to we're going to task seven uh, deacons that are strong in the word, that are wise. Uh, these are these are men of high regard that are going to make sure the people of God are taken care of again within the means that they that they have. They're not a weight on, on, on society. They're not looking for handouts. Because, you, again, there's a lot of cults that, that pop up, a lot of 
religious movements um, that are looking to deceive and to take, right? And of course, Rome's going to come and shut those down. And the Jews are going to try to shut those down too. We have the stoning of, C of Stephen. Again, this is this is emphasizing um, the disparity between the truth and the words of God and the insanity of those that want to kill them. What did Stephen do that deserved death here? Again, Stephen, I would say this is preaching. He's preaching to a, an unsaved group. His preaching was so offensive that they they broke the law and stoned him. They weren't per Roman law, they were not allowed to do this. Again, like if if you're an authority reading reading the book here, you're saying, "Man, this 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 kingdom is so powerful that even Stephen at the end of this would say, "Lord, forgive them for they don't know what they do." He's even praying for the people that stone him. Man, there's there's something more to this than just like uh like really good speakers and maybe somebody's got a lot of money and so people get fed with bread here and there or whatever. There's something more going on here because this Stephen guy just got stoned for for talking. <laughs> And in fact, if, if you're an authority reading this, you might get, you might you might say we need to go after that that, that uh, group of judges that put this guy to death. We have Simon the magician uh, emphasizing like there people see the power of the spirit. They see what's happening around them. This isn't this isn't normal. This isn't magic, right? This is the this is the contrast between an actual magician and the power of God. Even a magician is like. I know how to trick people, and this isn't trickery. There, there's a power that is that is given by some something, someone. And of course, what does Stephen want? He wants that power. He doesn't want to. He doesn't want to have to trick people. He actually wants uh, to be able to just conjure things uh, like he's seeing. Conjure the courage that Stephen has to be stoned. Conjure the power that that Peter has uh, to heal. Because Peter doesn't need to set up fancy booths and try to, you know, look at my hand here and then do the trick on, over here. Peter's just walking through the streets and, and says, gold I do not have, but what I do have is Jesus Christ stand up and walk. There's no hiding what they're doing. And of course, we see the judgment that uh, Simon the magician has when he asks if he can buy the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, for money. This kingdom isn't connected to the, the the point there is the kingdom isn't connected to the world. The kingdom is with Christ and it is with the spirit that's been poured out. And it can't be bought. It's got to be given by the Lord. The Lord is what is, is the Lord saves who he wills. It can't be demanded and the spirit will go where he wills and he will give salvation. And it's a salvation of peace. It's a salvation of order. It's a salvation that Rome should desire. And it's a kingdom that's not coming after you. But it is a kingdom that says, submit, like, bow to Christ now. Because there will be a time where Christ will come and destroy you. <laughs> we won't. We're called to bring we're called to bring salvation now because Christ is in the business of saving now. But there's a time when that's done. And that's why it's offensive at the end of the day, right? All right, then we have uh, Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. We have a we have a, a glimpse of the future here of the kingdom, right? Because now maybe maybe this this authority is reading this and saying, okay, I guess this is this movement is just secluded to the Jews. Um, it's just like this like little branch off of Judaism, and it's not really a big deal. It won't really go places. We have a hint of that of that being uh, absolutely the opposite direction. Philip and the eunuch. The eunuch's obviously reading Isaiah, right? And Philip's like, hey, do you know what you're reading? He's like, how do I know what I'm reading if nobody teaches me? Which, hey, church, remember that. <laughs> we can have the word, we can read it, but we still need teachers. And uh, and then Philip explains what he's reading, right? And he repents and he's baptized. Right after that, we have the conversion of Saul. I think this is really important for obviously two reasons. One, this is the this is the apostle that Christ has chosen. This is the one that is going to 
uh, take the place of, of Judas. I think it, the Psalm 62, the fulfill, fulfillment of Psalm 62. And it's also, again, showing the power that, that God has and even, and even turning the, the greatest antagonist against the church for himself. What power does a king have that can take the, the staunchest enemy and then melt him in a second? There's only one place that can come from. It has to come from the creator of the universe. It has to come from Christ himself. It has to come from the, the Holy Spirit. This is true power. This is the power of the kingdom. And it is to say, and Paul even says this in his epistles, why was I saved? So I can be an example as the greatest of sinners. If I'm saved, if Christ is going to save me, there, no one is out of the reach. No one is out of reach of, of God. And as long as, as Christ is still up in the heavens, right? And the angels are telling us, why do you look up up there? Salvation is possible now. And this is why we bring the gospel even to, the, to our family members that seem like the, the harshest antagonists of the gospel. This is why we hold the line when our families are telling us to compromise. This is, this is you got it, man. I, I, I think about when... Uh, Whoever, whoever this guy was that Luke wrote to, and he's reading this, he's got to be like, "That's crazy." <laughs> this Paul, who was at the stoning of Stephen, who who everyone put the robes down, who apparently is like a Pharisee of Pharisees, it's it's clear that he has authority. We're not really told what kind of authority that he has. Paul really, Paul doesn't really tell us the depths of his authority. He knows that he was commissioned to do this. He tells us that, but this guy was obviously up and coming. He had no reason. On the road to Damascus, what do you have like a midlife crisis? No, he met Christ. <laughs> That's it. He met the risen Lord. And then we have the beginning of Paul's ministry. He's healed. He's remember, He's blinded, and he goes to Ananias, and, he, and he's healed. We have a, 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 full, a, a fuller foreshadowing in chapter 10 of, of Peter and Cornelius, of the, the Gentiles, that the, the kingdom of God is not going to be restricted. Now, that's okay. That could sound scary to a government. Yeah, our kingdom is not just secluded to the Jews. <laughs> like, this kingdom is actually going to go everywhere. But, but look, you, you need not be, you need not to persecute us. Like we're for you. We're, we're, we're the citizens you want again, right? This is, we, we are the ideal citizens here. So Peter rec receives the vision. We know he goes to Cornelius. Um, this, this caused, a, uh, uh, this caused a lot of uh, upheaval in the Jewish community. Uh, a Gentile, uh, you're eating with Gentiles. They, you know, they received the Holy spirit. And Peter's like, yeah, he received the Holy spirit. And, I baptize them. And then the initial response was then, then the Gentiles are, are being saved as well. Right. And there's at first rejoicing, but this will come back to haunt Peter and uh, the Jerusalem council. Uh, Peter reports to the church. That's the, that's kind of the foreshadowing of what's coming on the Jerusalem council. We have the church set up in Antioch. So um, Luke is, Luke is saying, look, the, the apostles were given this commission to go out and preach and to baptize and to set up churches. Uh, these are the communities that we've just talked about. What are they doing in these communities? They're not, it's not secretive. You don't need to worry about us. Cause again, what are we doing? We're taking care of one another. We're praying for you. We're praying for you, right? We're going out and preaching the risen Christ and being stoned unjustly. We're being killed by the very people we're trying to bring this gospel to. And now as the, as this word is going out to the Gentiles, we're not going and trying to take your kingdom. This is just salvation going out to the world. And those groups are going to do the same thing that we've already told you that we're doing early on. We're hearing the apostles teaching. We're submitting. We're loving one another. We have uh, James killed, Peter imprisoned. Again, just, just showing... <laughs> 
just showing really like con contrasting who's who's actually uh, needing judgment here. The Christians that are going out peacefully and doing this or the governments that are coming down and killing us for no reason. Again, Peter's rescued. How is, how is he rescued, right? Peter doesn't break out of prison himself. You have the death of Herod. Again, the, here's, here's, the, here's the power of God in blasphemy. And if, 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 if you haven't read, I highly recommend you guys read this, but uh, Eusebius' Ecclesiastical History goes into more of what Herod died from, and it is absolutely horrid. It goes into great, gruesome detail of how Herod dies. Again, did, did the Christians do this? No. We're not, we're not the ones going in and supplanting Herod, right? Her Herod was blasphemous, and God judged him. It's the same God that has saved us, right? Warning. <laughs> like, we're not the one. Again, this isn't in our power to do. We're not coming and taking you out. But you have to submit to Christ. And rulers, you will be held accountable in a particular way. Herod was held accountable in a particular way. We have the, the Bar, uh, Paul and Barnabas sent off in chapter 13. And, and this is the beginning of Paul's uh, ministry as he's going and, and planting churches and checking in on them. Uh, the relationship of Paul and Barnabas are increasing. Um, this is, I, again, I think this is validating Paul's apostleship. Um, this is showing that what Paul is teaching, again, this is the power of God, too. You don't have Paul and Peter and John and, and the other Thomas and the other apostles teaching different gospels. They're teaching the same thing. Now, explain to me how a guy in Damascus who never spoke to the apostles learned all this theology about who Christ is, the one who wanted to kill him, the, who Christ says you're persecuting. Who could have cared less? I don't think I don't think Paul is like reading their scriptures to figure out what they believe so he can kill them better. He was just commissioned to go and find out who's under the who's part of the way and put them down, or at least imprison them, or squash that out. So you have this Paul for three years is taught by the resurrected Christ, the resurrected Christ, and is teaching and preaching exactly the same thing as these other apostles are teaching and preaching. That's an amazing thing. And there's no there's no border to to his teaching. Paul doesn't have bodyguards. Paul is uh, open to the, the to nature, right? He even says this, right? Like uh, we we tarried in uh, you know harsh weather and brigands and our own people tried to kill us, but who sustains them? Right? Who sustained him when he was shipwrecked? And he, and he was on that ship, and they were in the storm for like, it was like a month and a half or something. And Paul, Paul in a dream, right? God was like, look, you're, I'm, you're not going to die here. Now, now, the sailors had to do a particular thing for no one else to die, but that's who sustains them. And again, the, the Luke is trying to say, like, this is where the power comes from. We're not supplanting anyone. We're not creating bodyguards and being like the Mongols. Right, uh, horses like pillaging villages. We're bringing the, we're bringing the gospel of the resurrected Christ, and even the Pharisees at one point when they're when they're brought in, I think I, I passed this already, but they're but they bring in Peter again, and then you have the wise, I think it's uh, Hamil, when it's like, hey guys, you go outside, I need to talk to my my other, I'm gonna use slang here, my other bros, <laughs> my other Pharisees. Hey, you know there are other there are a lot of uh, people that claim to be a Messiah who all died. You know, Christ, this guy, Christ, Jesus Christ might be just another guy. But if he's not, you might end up finding yourself fighting against God himself. So we have uh, chapter 14, Paul and Barnabas uh, in Iconium. Again, uh, showing where these churches are being established. Um, all the, all the, uh, <laughs> the adventures of, of Paul and what he's doing. And then we, and then we come up to the Jerusalem Council. Um, and there's a, there's a lot of things that right, I did. I, I think this was a few months ago. 
at least a few months ago where we talked about the Jerusalem council and what we should, should get out of that. There's a lot of things to get out of that, but all, but in the overview, theologically, again, I think it's showing that um, we, as a polity, as a body work out problems together. We don't, we don't divide ultimately. The gospel isn't uh, isn't my kingdom here and your kingdom there, and we do our thing and you you do your thing, and don't come over to my territory as long as I go to your territory, and we'll be fine. That that's an earthly kingdom. That's how earthly kingdoms run, right? That's how Rome runs. But the gospel is united in Jesus Christ, right? So when there are problems that look like it's going to divide the church, it's showing like no, we early in peace and in humility. And we work these things out. Right? We don't come and conspire to over, over, overthrow you. We're not conspiring against one another. We'll have little war bands that are going to take your tribe out, my tribe, you know, and protect my tribe. That's not what we're doing. And in fact, we, we, we lighten the yokes of our people. <laughs> right? Like we lighten them. And there's an there's an understanding there's a theological there should be a lot of you know we're we're never after respect from um, those over us we're never after respect right because the the gospel is for the Gentile foolishness for the Jewish stumbling block but I can imagine that the, the respect the reader had here reading the theological connections that came out from this ruling about circumcision. Like it's not. This isn't surface level stuff. This isn't a bunch of uneducated people coming together and talking about their favorite sandwich, and it turned into a religious movement. This is deep rooted. We have uh, Paul and Barnabas separating. There, there's a sermon once that use use this uh, text as why it's okay for people to come apart. Um. I, I think this is in here to show, again, that Christians aren't superhumans, right? We're not sinless. There's all, there, there's still personal issues between brothers, uh, but that those differences don't come to like violent blows. They might come to to, to separations, um, and and of course, I think later we see the reconciliation of those two, but but it is it is to show like it is it to humanize what's going on too. Um, yeah, we, we deal with our problems and sometimes that means uh, we have disagreements. Um, I don't think this is uh, talking about it's okay then for a church to split because look, when Paul and Barnabas split, they didn't take churches with them. No church was harmed in the making of this video, right? <laughs> this was, this was a personal issue. Um, and, uh, but it is to say that even even as Christians in Christ, we're, we have problems, and this is how we deal with them. We have other elders being called. Timothy joins Paul right, and Silas, uh, again showing that how how do the leaders uh, replicate themselves in this movement? Right, they're actually called by by the apostles, the ones that that Christ have, has chosen to take the mantle to take the teaching that they've given them and to uh, and to uh, sanctify and also bring the gospel uh, to the world. So we have the Macedonian call. We have the dream, again, showing that the expansion of this kingdom, uh, the makeup of this kingdom. Uh, we have, again, Paul and Silas in prison, showing, it just again, it's showing the, the contrast of Paul and Silas being innocent men. And this is even worse, right? Because this is when they flog uh, a Roman citizen. <laughs> this is how unjust the system is actually treating Christians when they shouldn't. And this actually got magistrate in trouble, right? And this actually started the snowball into ultimately what Luke is wanting to communicate and that we're not a threat even to Caesar. Chapter 17, Paul and Silas and, uh, and Thess Thessalonica. Paul and Athens. Paul's addressing uh, the, the the Gentiles. So we see, again, the ministry now is expanding to the Gentiles. The Jews have rejected, right? Paul's like, you know what? I'm going to the Gentiles. I'm washing the, I'm washing the sand off my feet. I'm gone. I'm going to where the Gentiles are, and they're going to listen. 
So that's what he does. But again, is it like is it in a violent way? Is Paul like marching his armies out to Corinth? It's one guy. All right, you guys don't want to listen to me. I'm gonna go over here. And he's not like, is God gonna bring the power? Is am I gonna have the the power to to bring the word? There, there's not even a question of it. Because the the power of the kingdom that is established now is not in the physical things. It's not in kingdoms. It's not in institutions. Paul goes to Corinth and establishes probably the the best known church there is. Uh, Probably the second best church or second best known church is the church in Ephesus. We have the riot, right? So the actually, okay, the riots where all the snowballs start, right? But so they, <laughs> you read again, you read this as a as a, an official, and you're like, wow, people are rioting over nothing, <laughs> right? Even even the the magistrates that come out later, uh, and they're like, what are you guys even here for? What are you guys rioting against? Like they're gonna take away, uh, you know, worship to the your goddess? Like the magistrates are gonna come and, and put this down if you don't stop. Right. And then, of course, all the, the mob doesn't even know why they're there. Again, it's just showing the the um, it's not logical. The, the persecution against Christians, there is no basis for it. And the only, and really, the only, it's also saying the only reason that someone would persecute Christians then is because they hate the message. And why would anyone hate the, hate uh, a message if, if it's not true, if it doesn't prick the heart? Why would I care? Because again, does Paul, what power does Paul have? What what power does he have? He's one guy. He's not bringing in a political party and saying, uh, "Okay, now the the reign of uh, Athena is over. I've I've brought my cowboys, you know, to Tombstone. <laughs> you got to stop what you're doing." No, Paul is just saying, "Repent. Christ rose from the dead," and people are like, "Yeah, he did." Right. And then, of course, there 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 are important people that do that, or people that um, have influence or make money for other people, and you start converting them, and now those people that were making the money off them get upset, right? And now they start persecuting you because there's power in the message. And you can you can imagine if Paul brought himself a, a physical kingdom, the, it would be it would be confusing where the power came from. Did it come from God or did it come from the thing you brought. We got another uh, Eutychius is raised from the dead. Again, just showing the power that Paul has from this kingdom. Uh, chapter 21, Paul goes to Jerusalem. And Paul's arrested in the temple there. Uh, God promises that he's not going to die. They're not. He's not going to die in Jerusalem, but he's going to be taken to Rome. Uh, Paul, again, Paul speaks to the people. And again, Paul is completely rational in, his, in what he's saying here. He speaks in their own language. He speaks in Hebrew. Listen to me. I'm 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 not here to to stir you up. I'm here to preach Christ, the one you crucified, <laughs> but the one who was also will save you. Of course, they don't care, um, and the, the Romans are confused. Of why this guy is being brought up on charges. Uh, again, Paul's ministry looks a lot like Christ's ministry right now. Because what do they want? What do they want to do to Paul? They want to kill him for what he's saying. And then the Romans are like, why do they want to kill you? And, he, and Paul's like, that's a great question. And so Paul explains to them what he's saying. And they're like, yeah, you don't deserve death for that. But they're not going to release him. And, uh, and then in, as he's being held, right, we have higher and higher echelons uh, coming to, uh, to question Paul. So we have the plot against him that's thwarted by, um, by the guy that tells the Roman guard that there's a plot. And, of course, then we have Paul before Felix, right? And you can see how Paul, how does Paul interact with government? How is he interacting with, with those above him? Is, is he... Is he bringing harsh language against them? Is he saying you're going to burn? Um, Christ is rule over you, and and you're wicked. He actually no, he treats him actually with like, hey, I'm glad I get to, I'm glad I get to speak with you. Here's my message. Here's why I'm in prison. Here's why I'm being accused. Here's what I'm being accused of. And of course, Felix is like, oh, that 
why I don't understand why you're even here. <laughs> uh, and Felix actually, he's kind of like Herod. He likes hearing what Paul has to say. Um, and of course, he leaves Paul in prison as a uh, as a favorite of the Jews. And then uh, and then a Paul appeal, appeals to Caesar. He's about to be again. You see the 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 parallel to Christ. He was about to be let let go. He would have been let go. But he appeals to Caesar, right? And they're like, well, we would have let you go, but you appeal to Caesar, and to Caesar, you will go. So, uh, and that's after Paul defends himself before Agrippa. Again, um, just his conduct before a ruler, right? It is, it is above reproach. Um, he speaks calmly. Uh, he doesn't compromise, but he gives respect to Agrippa that he deserves, even though he's a wicked ruler. And Paul even explains his conversion to Agrippa. And at the end, he's like, I want you to be saved. I even want you to be saved. And Agrippa, Agrippa's like, Paul, you're cra- you know, all your studying has make, made you crazy. <laughs> you want me to be a Christian? And the last thing he says, uh, right, uh, what does he say? I got to read it. And Agrippa said to Paul, in short time, would you persuade me to be a Christian? And Paul said, whether short or long, I, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am. Of course, he, he I don't think this is almost like a joke, except for these chains. You can imagine, and he raises his hand, you know, except for these chains. Agrippa, Agrippa gets it. He doesn't believe, but he gets it. And then Paul goes to Rome. There's the storm that I talked about, the shipwreck, showing that God is preserving his life. And then, of course, when Paul is in Rome, right, and he's in the house, uh, everyone has such respect for Paul that he allows his friends to be there. He's ministered to people. In, uh, people in Rome are being saved by what Paul's doing. They know why he's there. There is no question why Paul is in prison. And Paul even says this. Everyone knows I'm there, not because I'm a robber, I'm a thief. I'm trying to usurp the kingdom. I'm trying to be a, a rioter. I'm there because of Christ. Everyone knows it. And that's why and that's why they're like, yeah, give him a house. Let him live in peace. Let his friends come. They treat him like, like the best you could treat a political prisoner at this point. And of course, Paul arrives at Rome, and then Paul is in Rome. And we have the end of, of the book of Acts in chapter 28. Um he said he Paul said he was compelled to appeal to Caesar. And he, at the very end, chapter or verse 28, therefore let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. He lived there two whole years. This is the house that is at his own expense, even at his own expense. Can you okay? I just compare this to like our, can you imagine if any American Christian right now, if they were at their own expense, supposed to live in this political prison, they would rebel against that. They'd be like, no, you're the ones that put me here. I'm not going to pay for anything. Even at the, even at Paul's own expense. So that Christ's name is above reproach and that all that he can be accused of, uh, of, of being a troublemaker for is preaching, preaching the gospel. He even at his own expense, is in uh, prison in Rome and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. And it ends there. It ends there. The, and the question is, why does it, why does Acts end there? Acts ends there because we're still looking, waiting for Christ to come. The kingdom of God is established the same way in Acts the only the, the power of God is bringing His gospel to bear. It is taking licks that are unfair. It is having our rights taken away from us, and yet we still, all we care about is Christ's name being above reproach, so that everyone knows that we're in prison not because we have we didn't pay our taxes, not because we don't like uh, the the pre, the whoever the president is, not because uh, we have to wear masks. We want any accusation. The only thing they can they can be able to actually throw against us and have it stick because they'll try to throw they try to throw stuff against Paul, right? 
he's a lawbreaker. He's a this. He's trying to stop us from worshiping this God. And da 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 da. The only thing that'll stick at the end of the day is that he preached Christ. That's the kingdom now. That's the power that's given to every one of us. And that's why when we're going through John and we're looking at our lives and we're getting rid of sin, it's because we want Christ to increase and we want ourselves to decrease. When we sin, we increase ourselves. We want ourselves to be seen. When we don't obey God, we we are giving the enemy accusations to solely Christ's name. This is why I'm I'm only interested in building up people. I'm building and building up the kingdom of God that's right here that shows up on Sundays and that's right here this morning. And I'm not worried about um what you know what politics we can bring into this country to try to bring America back or what, what, whatever system we concoct. I am, I am, I do want to show that those around us can count on Christians being the best citizens, being the ones that take care of one another and, and knowing for us for preaching the gospel. So the theological point of acts, right? Is that the kingdom of God is not physical. The kingdom of God is spiritual. We're empowered by the Holy spirit. The physical reality of the kingdom of God now is in what we do with one to one another, right? There's no way to get around it. And Acts stops there because the next part of the story is Christ returning. And the rest of the the rest of the epistles that we read are are a supplement increasing us to do what Acts says. That's what they are. So let's remember that when you read Acts, read it through that 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 uh, um, those glasses. Read read it through that uh, that window. This is this is the kingdom of God being defined for me right now. All right, questions. It's eight o'clock. Nothing. All right, uh, Manuel, you will uh, close in prayer. Amen. Amen.